These confused pictures show the British raiding the Sinn Féin office in an attempt to harass those setting up the alternative state. Before British repression, the Doyle and its bureaucracy went underground. But with coercion came a political initiative, the Government of Ireland Act. It was the old home rule idea. A parliament in Dublin with important powers reserved to Westminster and to accommodate the North, another in Belfast. The government wanted a Belfast parliament for the nine counties of Ulster, where there was the same number of Protestants, shown in orange, and Catholics, shown in green. The unionists preferred a six county state where Protestants would be the majority. The cabinet acquiesced. Despite the fact that Protestants would hold sway in the Belfast parliament, Many unionists, seen here protesting outside the House of Commons, remained unhappy with the home rule idea. They did not want home rule at any price. They wanted to remain forever a part of the United Kingdom. And they wanted, of course, the whole of Ireland to remain part of the United Kingdom. But since that was no longer possible, they had to accept the situation which Lloyd George now proposed to impose upon them. And uh, Craig, uh, Sir James Craig, in writing to uh, Lloyd George, actually described it as the supreme sacrifice. He said, we are prepared to make this supreme sacrifice in the interests of peace in Ireland. The Government of Ireland bill, so far as the Doyle was concerned, was to be ignored in its constitutional provisions. They believed that it would not operate, that it could be made uh, effectively abortive. And they concentrated, first of all, in getting the elections going to renew the mandate for the Republic, to participate in the elections in order to renew the mandate for the Republic, and simultaneously to escalate the guerrilla campaign in order to show the British that they meant business and that this solution was not acceptable. In the South, troops were a familiar sight, searches a daily occurrence. The Doyle would need an army to push Britain out of Ireland. Ireland. As British soldiers policed the streets, the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, was being organised in secret. Its strategy was to render the country ungovernable by, by demoralising the army and the police and paralysing the civil administration. The only tactic against a professional army was guerrilla war. We had the elected government and the British government of occupation. Uh, had their army and their forces there, and we had to establish it and lack of supplies and all that kind of thing. And the only way to do it was guerrilla warfare. Practically on an unarmed body of men fighting uh, one of the biggest empires at that time in the world, armed to the teeth with tanks, guns, and God knows what. There was nothing left to us except uh, guerrilla tactics. It was quite easy for us to do it because the people were with us. We had no enemies, only the British forces. During the early stages, like, police barracks were attacked and they were evacuated in the corner, they were evacuated, they were burned. And um, they had to pull back into more or less the stronger centres in the towns and places. Attacks on the Royal Irish Constabulary, the RIC, in the countryside had forced them back into the barracks in the towns. By mid-1920, 55 had been killed, and men were resigning, mainly as a result of threats to their families, at the rate of 200 a month. So the authorities were forced to recruit amongst ex-service men in England. I came back from the, from the war, the first war, and, and uh, I thought that anything was better than uh, standing in your queue. There were so many millions out of work. I was deciding to join up the French Foreign Legion and on inquiries I found out the pay was only 10 centimes a day. And then I saw this advertisement in the paper about the uh, Royal Irish Constabulary. Recruits wanted for the RIC with good pay, danger money, prospects of promotion and a pension on the end. So I thought to myself, well, why should I 
risk my life and perhaps limbs for 10 centimes a day when I could join the RIC and get good money. And then I went, had to go down to Chelsea to um, pass a test, which I did. And the next night uh, I caught the train from Houston Station and then I was in Avon Street, Dublin in the morning. By October 1920, more than 2,000 recruits had arrived to augment the Irish police. Although organised on military lines, they were nominally under police control. What the authorities never really clarified was whether they were to behave like soldiers or policemen. Their mixture of army and police uniforms symbolised their ambivalent role and gave them a nickname, the Black and Tans. As they patrolled the Irish countryside, their enemy was the IRA flying columns, groups of 20 men or so constantly on the move, attacking them and then melting into the countryside. A roadblock might be an ambush. Experience on the Western Front proved irrelevant when dealing with guerrillas, and the fight against an unseen enemy was both bewildering and frustrating. In Arnie, you know, at that time, there was the little low walls along the side of the roads. And if you saw one of those, you watched, because they'd be behind them. And if they dug a trench, you had to stop them. You were in action right away. And when we used to look up and we saw any pigeons or sparrows flying away from the roofs, we would dive into a doorway. Sometimes you might get a car with not enough protection, you'd be able to lob a grenade in. And all you could do then was say, here, share that amongst you. If we could catch them, we would kill them. If they were on the, uh, actually uh, uh, in the act of laying an ambush. It was a question of them or us. We were called by some journalists at the time the fleas and we bit him and away and came back and bit him again. We weren't, we weren't scared at all. We didn't care about him as long as, as long as that we had a chance to fight back. And if you can fight back and shoot back, then you feel all right. But it was, but it was difficult to shoot back. As killings and ambushes of the police and troops became commonplace, the Black and Tans began to take reprisals on those they suspected of harbouring the rebels. Creameries so crucial to Ireland's dairy economy were wrecked, like this one at Mallow. Houses were sacked and burnt. Suspects were shot. These reprisals convinced the Irish that Britain was unfit to administer Ireland and led them to support the IRA. The black and tans are remembered and hated to this day. They just ran through every town and village, um, guns at the ready, firing indiscriminately at passers-by. And um, at night, um, breaking into people's houses, taking all the males out and bringing them either to um, the jail or barracks questioning them and um, searching them and um, very often took people out and they were never, they didn't come back home again, they were killed. They were a complete lot to themselves, they were given a free hand to do what they liked and they did what they liked. They shot, burned, murdered, beat up, did anything they liked and they burned Balbriggan and many other Irish towns. 